I was first introduced to PID control when I was in engineering school. I took a class on systems design in which PID control was discussed. The professor explained that the PID acronym stands for proportional, integral, and derivative. The professor then proceeded to write an equation which involved several complicated mathematical terms. The equation included integrals, derivatives, and other mathematical expressions. But what I remember most from that class is that I didn't understand how the mathematical expression actually related to controlling a real-life process. After years of working in the control industry, I've learned that you don't need to understand the mathematics of the PID equation to use PID control. In this video, we'll explain PID control from a practical user's perspective. To keep things simple, we will primarily discuss temperature control, but many of the concepts will apply to other types of control as well. The reason the average user doesn't need to understand the PID math is because the instrument which does the control handles all of the math for you. These smart instruments are called temperature controllers. Modern temperature controllers are microprocessor-based instruments which contain the logic to control the temperature of a process. And what I mean by control is the action that drives the temperature of a process to a desired temperature level. This temperature level is called the set point. For a temperature controller to function, it must have a temperature sensor input, and the most common types of industrial temperature sensors are RTDs and thermocouples. A controller must also have at least one output. The output may be a relay, a pulse output, or an analog output. The output is connected to a control device such as a heater, fan, or valve. Before we dive into PID control, I want to start off by discussing on-off control, which is a simpler type of control. For many applications, on-off control works fine. When using on-off control in a heating application, the output turns on below the set point and turns off above the set point. This means if the output is connected to a heater, the heater will turn on when the temperature is below the set point and turn off when the temperature is above the set point. This is referred to as indirect acting control. It's called indirect acting control because as the temperature goes up, the power to the heater goes down. In a cooling application, the output is turned off below the set point and turned on above the set point. This type of action is called direct acting control. A typical application would be turning on a cooling device, for example, a fan, when the temperature goes above the set point. This type of control is called direct acting control because the power to the output increases as the temperature increases. The graph we drawn here shows the typical relationship between time and temperature for an on-off temperature control application. Below the set point, the heat is turned on, which causes the process temperature to increase. Once the temperature reaches the set point, the controller turns the heater off. This is a very simple type of control, but it tends to result in overshoot in which the temperature initially overshoots the set point. After the overshoot, the temperature will normally settle around the set point, but with oscillations that fluctuate above and below the set point. The magnitude of the overshoot and oscillations depends on the specifics of the process. Some processes may experience greater overshoot and larger oscillations than others. If overshoot and oscillations are not a concern, on-off control may be a good choice for the application. I'm going to show a graph for PID control similar to the one we've just seen for on-off control. However, before I do that, I need to talk about the different output options available for controllers. On-off controllers have either a mechanical relay or a pulse output. The pulse output is sometimes called a solid-state relay driver because it's used to control an external solid-state relay. BID controllers are also available with relay and pulse outputs, but they may also have an analog output, which is typically 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 5 volts DC, or 0 to 10 volts DC. Analog outputs are often used in flow or pressure control applications and not commonly used for temperature control, so we won't spend any more time talking about them in this video. Relay and pulse outputs are commonly used in PID temperature control. However, there is an important difference in the way that they are used for PID control versus on-off control. As we discussed in the previous slide, with on-off control, the output is on when the temperature is below the set point and off when the temperature is above the set point. With PID control, rather than simply switching the output from one state to another above or below the set point, the output of a PID controller is cycled on and off with the amount of time that the output is on varied to provide a more precise control. 
This control is called time proportioning control. We started this video by discussing the PID equation and why you don't need to understand how the equation works to use a PID controller. But it is worth mentioning that during time proportioning PID control, the equation is used to calculate the amount of time that the output is on or the duty cycle of the output. In a heating application, the amount of time that the output is on will be reduced as the temperature gets closer to the set point. This slide shows a typical time temperature graph of PID control, and as you can see, the overshoot and oscillations are much less than those we saw for on-off control, resulting in much tighter control. The actual magnitude of the overshoot and oscillations depends on specifics of the process, including the thermal mass of what is being heated, as well as the heater size and placement. One final topic I'll cover is tuning a PID controller. All PID controllers require tuning to adapt the controller to the specifics of the process. Tuning is a necessary function for accurate and precise control. To explain why tuning is needed, we'll take one last look at the PID equation. You may recall that the equation included three constants. Those constants are Kp, which is the proportional band, Ki, the integral multiplier, which is also called the rate, and Kd, the derivative multiplier, also called the reset. These constants are required to adapt the PID equation to a specific process. Manually determining these constants can be tedious, involving trial and error. Fortunately, manual tuning is not necessary since most modern controllers contain an auto-tune feature that allows the controller to automatically calculate the tuning parameters itself. It should be noted that most controllers also include a manual tune mode for those users who want the flexibility of being able to override the auto-tune function and enter their own PID parameters. This concludes the video. I hope you found it helpful. Please feel free to contact IO Thrifty with questions involving this video or any other topic related to process measurement and control.